In this movie, we're going to talk about setting up uh, for an inertia engine dyno, not a chassis, but an engine dyno. A lot of cart guys build these. Um, typically, it's a 24-inch diameter wheel by about an inch thick, good for about 15 horse. We've instrumented hundreds of these types of dynos. And to check out your dyno settings, or this is one of the critical things to getting accurate data, is to get your dyno settings set correctly. And what we have here is we got the different components that could be in your dyno. The main wheel is the most important. And if you got the basic version, that's the only thing you can set. But typically, this is where most of your inertia is anyway. And this one here happens to be uh, different. It's 23 inch diameter by 4.1 inches thick, almost 500 pounds. And you can see this number over here. This is the important number. It is 222, roughly, pound-foot squared of inertia. And that doesn't mean much to you. This means something to you, 500 pounds. But this is the number that is actually important. For example, I'm going to put another component in here. Let's say the shaft. And the inside diameter being blank means it's zero, so it's a, it's a solid wheel. But let's say we have a, a shaft here that was four inches in diameter. And... Um, the ID is zero. And let's say it was 150 inches long. It's steel. And you can see we got over 500 pounds of weight in this shaft. And little drawings here to show to sort of the scale to show you relative size between these the flywheel and the shaft. And it weighs over 500 pounds. It weighs a lot more than this wheel. But because the diameter is so small, it only puts out seven and a half pound foot squared of inertia. So don't think by putting, getting so many pounds, you're simulating a vehicle of a certain weight or anything. It doesn't work that way. What's important is the inertia. So let's just turn this off, and let's say it's zero. And you can see we zeroed that out, and now the total inertia here is the same as that. And this is showing the percentage, that this wheel here is making up 100% of the total system inertia. And you could go in here and add some different components if you wanted to. These just happen to be leftover specs from the last time these things were set, turned on. And you can see the, all these smaller things, 6-inch diameter, you know, weighs a couple of pounds. This thing weighs 6 pounds. You can see it all is basically adding up to no inertia, these extra components. If you had a significant component here, let's say you did have some 12-inch diameter thing that was 2 inches thick. Um, 22 pounds, 12 inch diameter, it would start adding up to some significant inertia and bump this up. And again, you can see the little drawing here to show you relative size of these different components and stuff. But you, for now, we're just going to keep that turn, th those turned off, but you can use them. This is an advantage of the Pro that you can get all your different components and be more precise on this inertia. Other dyno specs we have here are if you do a coast down test on an inertia dyno, a coast down test, and you look this up in the back of the book in the index, you would rev your engine up in your dyno flywheel and just let it coast down. You'd have a one-way clutch so the engine would not be breaking the uh, flywheel, so it would just coast down. And it's going to take three, four minutes for that flywheel to coast down and it, with, if you got decent bearings at all without a lot of friction. And you are going to time from the start to the end of the test um, how long it takes to go through three different specs or three different levels of RPM. Now you can automate this process. If you're looking coast down in the index, you can actually do this automatically. But let's say uh, you did it manually. You just recorded, maybe you watched the tack on the data might screen or whatever. And let's say at 1500 RPM, that's where you started at zero seconds. Then you wait until you got to 1000 RPM at about 120 seconds later. And then you got to 500 RPM, which is 320 seconds later, which is you know, over five minutes, and it's going to show you here your horsepower loss, that at 1,500 RPM, you had one horsepower of loss in the friction of the bearings, which is actually pretty high, but I just made these numbers up, so I mean, that's probably why they're high, and what this would do is this will add in an additional one horsepower at 1,500 RPM because there's that much friction in the bearings and windage losses and stuff. At 1,000 RPM, it'll add in an additional half horsepower, and at 500 dyno RPM, this is dyno RPM, uh, an extra tenth. So that's how coast down works in a nutshell. Um, we have different dyno types. Engine direct drive, which for inertia dynos typically is not used. Maybe some small RC motors and stuff. 
you could do it. But these are the two that are typically used, engine with a clutch or engine no clutch. Engine with a clutch means that there is clutch slippage and you should be measuring the engine RPM and the dyno wheel RPM both. If you say engine no clutch, what that means is the program is going to assume that there's no clutch slippage, that there is a direct relationship based on the gear ratio between engine and dyno RPM. And when you say that, it lets the program, gives it some options that you can run your tests with only one RPM, either just engine RPM or just dyno RPM. And that can be very handy if you have some strange engine ignition system that just won't cooperate and give you a nice engine RPM signal. Or you broke your dyno RPM sensor and all you got is engine RPM, but you still got to keep testing. So that's what this engine no clutch is for. And if you say engine no clutch, you've got to put in the gear ratio correctly because everything is based on that. Um, if you say engine with clutch, the gear ratio, you still put it in, but the only thing it's used for is if you go and calculate, if you want to graph out clutch slippage or something, then you have to have the gear ratio done correctly. But for the torque and horsepower curves and stuff, this really isn't that fussy. But if you say engine no clutch, this gear ratio is critical. Now, a point I should make with inertia dynos is there are advantages to inertia dynos and there's disadvantages to inertia dynos. One of the disadvantages of an inertia dyno is you've got all this power that you've absorbed from your engine stored in its rotating inertia. And there is a lot of energy in that. For example, let's say you get this 500 pound wheel spinning at 3000 RPM, which I think is too high personally. but if something would happen, so that let's say something got jammed into that flywheel and all of a sudden that flywheel stopped, that energy is not going to just go away. It's going to impart itself on your whole dyno stand, engine, whatever. And even if you've got it nailed down to the floor, it's probably going to rip itself out of the floor and go tumbling through your wall and you don't want to be alongside that thing. So you've got to respect all the energy stored in these spinning flywheels. Um, we got a little button here you can click on and we'll give you some uh, ideas on what we believe about this uh, particular setting that setup you got here uh, and we we'll also give some information here and we would suggest this is a suggestion of an RPM limit you do things right you can go above this if you do things poorly poorly designed system you can't even get close to this RPM and be safe and all this RPM is looking at is the burst burst RPM of that flywheel. At what RPM will the internal stresses of just that spinning disc be so high that the flywheel can start coming apart? And there's a lot of other things that to be considered other than this. So anyway, the bottom line with an inertia dyno is it makes sure you're safe when you design it and when you operate it. Here we are at our website and if you look at support, FAQs, frequently asked questions, and go down Dino data might data logger questions and there are topics in here coast down there's a lot of good stuff in here that you should look at what are the advantages and disadvantages of an inertia dyno and the advantages of an inertia dyno like I said it's very simple to build you only need to measure dyno RPM so there's no torque sensor it's cheaper you got great speed control it just accelerates very smoothly um, the system repeats because it is so simple there's so little to change it is very repeatable and bang for the buck it is it is by far the best thing to do now the disadvantages is you can only measure performance while the engine is accelerating you cannot hold the speed for example if you want to hold 3000 rpm and go tweak on the jets or something on a Briggs you can't do it it, it only works when it's accelerating okay um, Large amounts of steel are required for high power engines, can be unsafe, do all the stored energy. And you cannot, here's a subtle point, you cannot measure torque and horsepower at the exact beginning or end of a run. What that means is if you rev your engine through your inertia dyno and you kill it at 7,000 RPM, we cannot measure the power at 7,000 RPM because we got to measure the acceleration rate. And we don't, at 6,000 we can because we know where was that, let's say, 
5,500 RPM and, and what time it was, and then we know what the time it was at 6, and then we know what the time at 6,500 RPM. We then know, can figure out the acceleration exactly at 6. But when you're at 7,000 RPM, we know, let's say, where it was at 6,500, how much time ago it was at 65. At 7, we know the time then. We don't know where it would have been at 7,500. You cannot, it's called differentiating the data, and you cannot get the exact axle rate. So if you rev it to 7, you're probably going to get data up to about 67 or 6,800. And it's a subtle point, but it can be important to some people. So if you want good data at 7, you better rev it a few hundred RPM past 7,000. Another uh, couple of inputs on this screen are sections and main wheel, one, two, or three, and how many main wheels you've got. And the best way to explain that is in the user manual, there's a nice picture of this. This, I believe, is page 68 in the book. And sections are like this. You've got a, a wheel, this is a cross section, that has different cross or thicknesses, let's say. And you can break the wheel up into different sections, up to three sections. And this other one is you have one wheel, main wheel, and you can add additional wheels that are exactly the same. So that's what number of wheels, and that is what sections have to do with. And that concludes this movie.